In the early days of World War II, the Germans hatched a master plan to take down the mighty French army with breathtaking efficiency. Dubbed Fall Gelp, or Case Yellow, it was a strategy that involved attacking France through the least expected region, the dense, foreboding Ardennes forest. But it would be in the Belgian town of Anou where the fiercest fighting occurred. The 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions of the mighty 16th Motorized Corps of the Wehrmacht locked horns with the 1st and 2nd Light Mechanized Divisions of the French Cavalry in a battle of epic proportions. Over three tumultuous days, from May 12th to 14th, 1940, the ground shook with the thundering roar of 1,200 German and French tanks as they clashed in a battle for supremacy. This was no ordinary battle. It was the largest tank battle of the entire campaign, and the most significant clash in armored warfare history at the time. For some, it was even the first real tank battle of World War II. The first move. The commanders of the French and British troops thought the Ardennes was impassable. Moreover, they believed the Germans would enter northern France through Belgium, just like in World War I. As dictated by Allied military doctrine, they would build and fortify line after line of defenses to resist the German invasion, reminiscent of static defense lines built during the previous war. But the Germans were strategically superior from the start. Their primary goal was to allow Army Group A to launch their main attack through the Ardennes, while the strongest elements of the French First Army were tied down somewhere else. The German breakout from the Ardennes was scheduled for May 15th, five days after the German attacks on the Netherlands and Belgium. The delay was intended to make the Allies believe that the brunt of the German attack would come through Belgium and then into France. The Allied armies advanced into Belgium, according to the Dial Plan, which called for the deployment of troops to the border between Belgium and France. Unfortunately, given that Belgium declared itself neutral in the conflict, Allied forces could not deploy along the border between Belgium and Germany. They had no choice but to let the Germans strike first. Hammer and Anvil. It was May 10, 1940, when the Germans put their plan into action. The powerful Panzergruppe Kleist from Army Group A made its way through the thick Ardennes forest between Belgium and Luxembourg. It aimed to enter northern France and make its way to the English Channel. Simultaneously, Army Group B, located further north, marched into Belgium. The move served to cut off the British and French forces, isolating them in Belgium and northern France. Panzergruppe Kleist ended up behind the Allied forces, aiming to crush them with Army Group B in a classic hammer and anvil move. The Germans decided to increase the strength of Army Group B by allocating a Panzer Corps under its command. This was the 16th Motorized Corps, led by General Erich Heppner, consisting of the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions with 620 tanks, including 496 Panzer Ones and Twos, 73 Panzer Threes, and 52 Panzer Fours. As the war began, the French Cavalry Corps entered Belgium, seeking to secure the strategically imported Jean Blue Gap. These two light mechanized divisions pushed toward the village of Anou and took positions there to cover the Jean Blue Gap. The French believed they could prepare for a prolonged defense against Jean Blue, about 34 kilometers west of Anou. However, the German offensive operations in eastern Belgium at Anou and Jean Blue tied down the Allied armies, preventing them from moving west and securing their flank. Meanwhile, the German 16th Motorized Corps broke through Dutch and Belgian positions and raced toward the Jem Blue Gap. A great battle was imminent. Holding the reins. Seizing the opportunity, the Germans pushed toward the English Channel, which would encircle and destroy the Allied forces. Meanwhile, the French sent two armored divisions forward to conduct a delaying action against the enemy advance and give the rest of the First Army time to dig in at Jem Blue. The Corps de Cavalerie was a newly formed, fully mechanized unit made up of the 2nd and 3rd Light Mechanized Divisions. These divisions were equipped with the latest armored vehicles, replacing the horses that had served their predecessors for centuries. The 3rd Light Mechanized Division was stationed along the Tirlemont Anou line, while the 2nd Light Mechanized Division held the Anou Uy line. Their combined force boasted an impressive array of weaponry, including 600 tanks and vehicles, such as Somua S 35 tanks, AMR 35 tanks, and Panhard 178 armored scout cars. This formidable unit was the pride of the French army, a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. The Cavalry Corps' mission was clear, engaging the enemy and slowing their advance. 
Their doctrine of armored warfare dictated their tactics. The delay in the German breakout from the Ardennes was a stroke of luck. It gave them time to mobilize their troops and move them into position in Belgium. Nevertheless, the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions came thundering down the road, heading straight for the point where the two French divisions met. Under pressure. On the morning of May 12th, the tranquility in Anu was shattered by the sound of German armored vehicles charging into French positions, forming a menacing wedge-shaped formation. The ensuing battle was intense, with fighting breaking out everywhere. Despite their best efforts, the German advance was stopped by fierce resistance from the French armored cavalry. The first day ended with neither side emerging victorious. However, the Germans were not deterred and attacked again on the second day. General Eric Hepner ordered his troops to focus their attack on one point of the French line, and the 3rd Light Mechanized Division found themselves under heavy pressure from a concentrated German assault. To make matters worse, the Germans launched spoiling attacks with infantry units, preventing nearby French forces from supporting their allies. Furthermore, with the help of the Luftwaffe, the German 16th Motorized Corps managed to break through French defenses along tirlemont anou Uy. Realizing they were outmatched, the French Cavalry Corps quickly withdrew to Perway, with the Germans in hot pursuit. Just two days after the invasion of Belgium, the Germans made their way into Anou. And while the French were able to fall back to Jambleu as planned, albeit following several failed attempts to take the town, the Germans had a strategic victory. They succeeded in tying down substantial Allied forces, which would have otherwise been deployed to the Ardennes. Still, the Germans failed to completely neutralize the French First Army at Anou. Although they inflicted significant losses on the defenders, the Germans would eventually be stopped at Perway. And thus, the tank battle of Anu came to an end. A heavy toll. In the end, the Germans were able to control the battlefield and outflank the French, who lost 30 S-35 tanks due to insufficient combat radius. Plus, the French light mechanized divisions deployed their tanks thinly across long lines resulting in many losses due to attrition. In contrast, the Germans concentrated their tanks on a single point, giving them a decisive advantage in battle. In addition, the German tanks were manned by five crewmen, which reduced reaction time and spread out stress among the crew. The French tanks were more suited to static defense and stressed the importance of armor over mobility. Indeed, the French cavalry fought hard and achieved their objective of stalling the German advance, but they were still defeated. On the other hand, the German armored units took severe losses. Most of their tanks were light Panzer 1s and 2s, which were no match for the French S-35 and H-35 tanks. Only the Panzer 4s, with their 7.5cm guns, could fight back, but even they struggled against the heavily armored French tanks. Despite the odds against them, the German tank crews fought with personal resolution and courage. They flanked the French tanks and attacked their weak points, but it was a brutal and costly fight claiming 160 German tanks. Most of their damaged tanks were refitted and returned to service, but 49 were damaged beyond repair. In contrast, the French Cavalry Corps lost 121 tanks. The Lightning War The tank battle of Anu was a pivotal moment in the war. It was the first time that the German and French armored doctrines clashed, and it highlighted the importance of tank design and combat tactics. General Heinz Guderian noted that the Panzer III and Panzer IV tanks had a good balance between firepower, mobility, and armor, thus becoming an early advocate for the Blitzkrieg strategy. In the subsequent Battle of Jambleu, from May 14th to 15th, the French once again scored tactical successes, which allowed them to retreat to Lille, despite being seriously maimed, where the First Army would further delay the Germans in the siege of Lille. What's more, the force would prove instrumental in the re-embarkation of the British Expeditionary Force, as well as French and Belgian troops, at the infamous evacuation of Dunkirk a few weeks later. Ultimately, the Battle of Anu was a strategic victory for the Nazis, who had secretly crossed the Ardennes in preparation for a mighty blitz that would bring the Allies to their knees. Thank you for watching. Hit that subscribe button to become part of our community and never miss an episode. And get ready to dive into the fascinating world of dark documentaries, where we bring you the most thrilling and thought-provoking historical accounts. Stay tuned for more.